Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to begin with, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight, the Darug and Gundungurra people and their elders past and present. <laughs> um, we can have a, a bit of quiet up the back, please. Uh, look, not many sane people enjoy coming to meetings, particularly long meetings. Uh, and I'm aware a lot of people here tonight are going through a slew of meetings at the moment. So the intention tonight will be to keep this meeting uh, fairly tight, uh, fairly specific and keep it moving along uh, so you're not here any longer than you need to be. Uh, my name is Brendan Lucchetti. I'm Deputy Mayor of the Blue Mountain City Council and a Ward 3 councillor, um, playing a very small role this evening, uh, which basically uh, we'll, we'll finish in a few minutes. Um, Council and the Rural Fire Service are joint hosts for this information session tonight, uh, which is designed for owners, builders and designers, specifically tailored at rebuilding fire damaged homes, homes in fire prone areas. Um, before we move into any content, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the presence of a few people here. Um, you'll be hearing from some of them, but not all of them. First of all, Phil Koperberg, uh, who needs very little introduction. But let me say this, uh, you know, from the view I've had of the magnificent work he's done in our community, uh, he's been a real asset in this very difficult time. Um, council has made representations to the state government uh, that we extend his tenure in his role uh, at least through to January uh, so that he is still available to this community. Uh, and, and we're optimistic that that will be well received because uh, his original sort of tenure will end uh, way too quickly. So you will be hearing from Phil shortly and he's got some very valuable news and updates to share with you. Also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my Ward 3 Councillor colleagues, uh, Mick Fell, who's Councillor's representative on the Recovery Committee, um, Chris Vander, also Daniel Miles as a Ward 3 Councillor and former Mayor. Um, I've also seen uh, Ward 2 Councillor Chris Vanderclay, uh, who's here tonight. Also, I'd like to acknowledge David Jones here, the local fire controller, who did an outstanding job uh, in the response phase of the fire crisis. Uh, and again, we thank you for your great work, David. Also, from the Rural Fire Service, we have Jeff Lucas and Michelle Streeter. Uh, Michelle will be presenting tonight um, from the RFS. From Blue Mountain City Council, we, we have a lot of staff here, so I won't introduce them all, um, but I will make mention of Robert Greenwood, the General Manager, Lee Morgan, who is the Director of Development, Health and Customer Services, Steve Corbett, who is the Director of City and Community Outcomes, and Damien Drew, who is the Director of City Services. Um, I should also pay note to Nigel Bell, uh, an architect uh, who will be presenting tonight. Um, Chris Brogan from Council will be presenting and Norm Foster will be presenting from Fair Trading. Um, to my right is Lucy Cole Edelston who will be working as a facilitator tonight to make sure that the evening stays on topic and on time. I know. Look, to begin with, I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome to fire affected residents. So I think that we've lost um, sound down in the Macquarie room and they're there just trying to fix it now. So while they do that, can I ask some of the people over here who are going to stand, do you want to come over onto this other side? It just might be a bit more comfortable. So the Macquarie Room want you to start from the beginning because they're worried they've left something out. So I think just say that. Just say, I think just say, just if anybody did exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Is this one mic'd up to that room? What if it needs me, I'll just lean into it. Right, so it is that one. Yeah. Okay, right. but that one wasn't loud enough. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll try again. Uh, this microphone is, is going to do both rooms, so we we'll just have to sort of lean into it. 
Um, look, for the benefit of the people in the Mac okay, can you hear me now? No. How's that? No good? No? Look, I, I can do it without, but it's no good for the people in the other room. No, it's kind of glued in. Well, I can hold it up. Yeah. No, it's just been unplugged. One, two, how's that? Is that better? Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Okay, look, for the benefit of the people in the Macquarie Room uh, who heard nothing of uh, the introduction, I'm not going to uh, go through it again because it effectively it was just a roll call of people who were here. So of the content that they came here to get tonight, they've missed nothing. So continue. Look, where I was at was extending a welcome to the fire-affected residents. Uh, and, and the focus of the evening is about you and it's for you. Um, look, as a representative of the community, uh, let me say this. Um, you know, we're with you. You're working on a, a very long, it's going to be a very difficult and at times very painful journey. Um, I, I admire the resilience that you have shown so far and in, in the courage, and I know that is reflected uh, throughout the community. Uh, so you know, we are with you throughout, uh, but again, it, it has been difficult and I know it will continue to be difficult for you for a very long time. I'd also like to welcome to this gathering tonight uh, architects, builders, designers and tradesmen who have come uh, knowing that the jobs that they do are going to be different in this area. Uh, I know a lot of local builders and designers and tradesmen have come here so that when they take jobs from you, they will be completely informed uh, about what they need to do for you uh, and the new requirements. And look, to these people I, I say this, look, you are going to be the people that, that really sort of light the, the flame of hope again in our community. When we see the rubble cleared from the blocks, when we see our broken streets cleaned up, you people will be in there, you'll be turning the, these sort of charred ruins into building sites, which will be the first sign that we're going forward. You'll be turning those building sites into magnificent new homes. You'll be turning those streets back into neighbourhoods. Uh, and when we see that happen, uh, that's when we will start to sort of heal from this and recover as a community. So uh, I commend you on, on the hard work and, and the resourcefulness that you will have to lend that task. It is inval invaluable. Um, look, the role of council, um, and, and we have been supported by Penrith Council in this, but the role of Blue Mountain City Council has been and will remain to support our community through this very difficult time. Um, we have directed a significant amount of our resources to the fire recovery effort um, and the rebuild is the next part of that. And that will continue to be our focus in the short term, the mid term and probably the long term. Um, it has been said by the Mayor, the way that we respond to this will define us as a council. Um, and we will leave no stone unturned in responding to your needs. Um, you know, if there's a need that we haven't identified, uh, let us know and we will respond accordingly. Um, on that, uh, as a council on Tuesday night, we voted to waive uh, most of the fees uh, that we have identified already associated with the DA process. Um, and you know, we are looking for some you know, short-term help. Uh, you know, anything we can do to make a difference, we will do. Um, on top of that, uh, I should note that the Merrill Relief Fund uh, you know, is continuing to re receive significant donations from around the state. It's up to about one and a half million dollars and the first meeting of the board uh, who will sort of oversee that will be on Monday. Um, and look, our, our view is to get that money to the people who need it uh, as quickly as possible, as seamlessly as possible. And uh, we will make it known how to make application for that money uh, if you have the need. Uh, look, as councillors, uh, you know, from the ward, Ward 3, uh, myself, Mick and Daniel, our, our job is to support you and to advocate for you. Uh, whether that's, you know, working with council or, or other bodies, if you need help, if things aren't working, uh, give us a ring and we will do what we can. Um, as I said earlier, we don't have much of a role to play tonight. However, at the end of this evening, uh, the three of us will repair 
out to the bar to have a drink to support this great club who really supported this community when we needed them. If you want to have a chat, um, if you want to raise anything, feel free to come out and join us. Uh, I will now hand over to Lucy who will give you more of an overview of the evening. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, I can't imagine um, the hell that a lot of you have been through, and, uh, and you know, look, it's an honour to be working with you tonight. I have one job tonight, which is to make sure that you get the information that you need tonight. Tonight is all about providing you with some of that basic information so you can take the next steps. So we've got a number of presenters who are just going to step you through and give you some information. Um, we've provided, there's been pens and paper around um, on seats so that you can take some notes. Um, but we're also, Council's also videoing all the presenters. None of you are going to be videoed. I'm sorry if you thought this was your moment, but the presentations are all going to be videoed. It's going to be put up onto Council's YouTube station. So anybody you know who couldn't make it tonight, they'll be able to download that and look at it. It will also a full transcript of what all the presenters say, plus all the questions that you ask, and their answers will also be available on Council's website from tomorrow. So if anybody wasn't able to get here tonight, we want to make sure that that information um, is available. So tonight really is about providing you some of that really useful and general advice. Um, and uh, Council's going to give you some information about a service that Council and the Rural Fire Service are putting together to help you uh, to start making those decisions and taking those next steps to rebuilding your homes and rebuilding your lives. Um, we've got a lot of you, so can I just ask just some simple things, like if you've got a mobile phone, can we just turn it off, particularly given that we're having these technical issues? <laughs> I don't want any mobile phones going... <laughs> um, just, you know, off to silent. Um, there is going to be time for questions. So what I'm going to do is, if you've got burning questions after each presenter, then I'm going to take a few questions. But then we'll have the major question um, thing at the end. Yeah, it's looking a bit dodgy, isn't it? Um, we'll have the major question session at the end. We've only got one roaming mic. So if you've got a question, stick your hand up. I'll come to you in the order that you put your hand up. If you could just keep your question as short and as succinct as possible, that would be great, just because there's lots of you and I know we want to get through and get through to you as much as possible. Uh, and as uh, Councillor Lucchetti said, um, Lucchetti, sorry, said, uh, council staff also will be available after the presentation, so, and as I'm sure some of the RFS. So if you don't feel comfortable asking a question in this forum, please just wait until afterwards and I'm sure you'll be able to, to get that question answered. So I'll just ask um, that if we can just um, uh, act with a decorum and respect, just because it's going to be um, you know, at least an hour of presentations. I will give you opportunity to ask questions in the meantime. Please don't get frustrated if we can't answer all your questions um, immediately. I'm sure you appreciate that all of us are, are learning as we go with this. And the intent of everybody in this room tonight is to do the best they can by people who've lost their homes and have been affected by their fires, these fires, and to learn what's working and what's not working, and if it ain't working, to figure out how to fix it as quickly as possible. So, uh, as once again, thank you, and I'd like to hand over to Phil Koberberg, who has been doing such a marvellous job. Thank, thank you, Lucy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to you. I'm not going to take a lot of time with a preamble. Uh, suffice it to say this, M my job and that of the very many wonderful people and hard-working people and extraordinarily professional people I've got working with me is to unblock blockages where they occur and to take obstacles out of the way of the, um, the path to recovery. Uh, I have been known for about 40 years as the state's most terrible bureaucrat because I don't take orders from anyone and invariably if someone tells me to do something I do the opposite and uh, in this case that, that is very much what is needed. Can I say at the outset that the progress we've made hopefully uh, is beginning to pay dividends uh, and we could not have made that progress without the support of the Blue Mountain City Council. Uh, it is the level of support provided by the council uh, is unprecedented. Uh, right. You know, from policy decisions uh, in, in terms of making concessions, uh, accommodation, telecommunications, communications, uh, and just general support for the collective efforts which have to prevail 
uh, if this road to recovery uh, is going to be as painless as it possibly can for you acknowledging the pain. You can be assured that we will do all that is necessary uh, to remove obstacles. Uh, we can't replace what you've lost. Uh, we can't pretend to know how you feel. Uh, suffice it to say that before the 17th of October, uh, I used to get fall asleep listening to... Before the 17th... Well, it's, it's as loud as it'll go. Uh, before the 17th of October, I used to fall asleep listening to Wind in the Willows. Now I fall asleep wondering how soon we can get Buena Vista rebuilt or Emma Parade rebuilt or plants in the gardens and everything else. So you'll have our unequivocal commitment that we will work as expeditiously and as efficiently uh, as we can uh, to help you along that road to recovery. Now, um, I can tell you tonight that what you will hear is going to be complex. Uh, a range of codes, Australian standards and so forth have come to, p come to pass since you built your house or since you bought your house. And now that your house is destroyed and you are facing rebuilding, there are going to be complications there that were not there before. And it is going to be challenging. It's going to be challenging for the council. It's going to be challenging for the rural fire service. But most of all, it's going to be challenging for you. Uh, our job is to get rid of unnecessary red tape. Our job is to ensure that the application of the rules uh, is done in such a way as to be sympathetic to the fact that you need to get back into your house uh, as soon as it's practically possible to do so. The first hurdle has been overcome. We've received today a commitment from the New South Wales and federal governments that it will accept responsibility through an arrangement with the insurance companies to clear all of the sites including asbestos sites and again and again thanks again it's it's nothing is ever simple it's complicated suffice it to say that those of you who are insured will have uh, oh, for that matter those of you sorry I'll, re I'll start again those of you who've had your prop your houses totally destroyed and are insured uh, you will have the debris, the rubble removed through an arrangement between the insurance industry and the, um, and the Department of Public Works. If you've already taken measures to clear your land, then the cost of the measures you've taken will be reimbursed to you by the insurance companies, which will in turn claim it back from the government funding. And it's a joint federal and state funding arrangement. If your house is only damaged and therefore it is intended that you repair it, it is expected that the removal of any residual uh, matter will be taken care of by the insurance company under the policy that you've got. If you are uninsured, you will have all of the rubbish, all of the debris removed from your house under this current system. So essentially, apart from a few minor details that need to be sorted out, the long-awaited decision to do what we're going to do, which will save you, depending on your particular circumstances, many thousands of dollars because asbestos-impacted sites, were you to have to do it uh, and claim under your insurance, may have cost you as much as ten, fifteen, or $20,000 or more. This is an expense you will now not have which will assist you in the process of rebuilding under a new set of rules which didn't apply when you last built or bought your home. So the road ahead is going to be difficult. Um, you will hear a range of issues to be... You'll hear about a range of issues to be dealt with tonight. Uh, but tonight is not the end of the conversation. Uh, there will be obstacles to be overcome. There will be blockages to be unblocked. And uh, the, the recovery, recovery committee and the Council and the RFS uh, are committed to streamlining the process uh, as much as it is humanly possible. Again, I'll say what I've said to every forum, and there'll be a number of these as the weeks and months go by. If you have a problem, I don't, I don't care how small it is or how large it is, that you are having difficulty getting resolved, please come to the recovery office, which is situated underneath the Council Library uh, in other words, the council offices in Macquarie Road, Springwood. 
and uh, you all have my mobile number, and I know you have, because now I re receive 700 calls a day, um, and I'm going to I'm going to divide my telephone bill by uh, 200 and send you each one two hundredth of it. Uh, but you know where to find us, is what I'm trying to say, okay? And we are there to ensure that there is no unnecessary red tape, that your difficult road is not made any more difficult than it needs to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. I'd now like to ask Lee Morgan, who's the Director of Development, Health and Customer Service, to come up. Thanks very much, Lucy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, look, I'm not going to repeat uh, everything that Phil said. They, they, I just want to reinforce that both the Council and the RFS are about a, setting up a dedicated service that's going to help affected residents recover and rebuild and build back better than, uh, than the houses that were lost. Yes, there's regulation to deal with. That regulation is aimed at making our housing uh, safer and giving us better outcomes. We aim to make those approvals simpler, faster and less costly by this dedicated service. And as I say, that's, that's being really pursued strongly by both RFS and Council working together. Tonight you will get an initial uh, explanation uh, a bit about how bushfire protection requirements are determined. And, uh, and, and you'll get details on the types of assistance that will be offered and how to access those from RFS and, and Blue Mountains. But you'll also first get um, an outline from uh, Nigel Bell on how fires affect buildings and what are the, some of the critical design elements that can help us overcome that. But he'll be talking to you about that you know, in broad principles so that we can all see what the value is of looking at uh, new and, and better design. And the last, well, the two, two last points. One, um, tonight is about a more general process. The dedicated service centre at Springwood, and you'll get details about that, will give you the site-specific, design-specific advice. So tonight's more about general than being able to deal with, with individual sites. And lastly, the Council is uh, managing and coordinating the, the uh, database for the state government recovery effort. Quite a few of you will have provided us with contact details for you, for, for you but if you need to update that, so that we can keep progressing the work by the, making contact with you as we need to. We do have council officer at the rear of the room and we'd encourage you to go and give your update details to them or if you have never registered there and there are one or two properties where we haven't been able to get contact details, please also see that council officer at the end. So thank you very much. Thanks Lee. I'm now just going to introduce Nigel Bell. Um, Nigel, um, I'm sure most of you know, has written three national environmental design guides. He's taught bushfire issues to architects. He led the community recovery process in Victoria after 2009 fires. And he's done a number of other things to do with bushfires. And he is now going to come and give you uh, a presentation on the, some of the details you need to be thinking about going forward. Over to you, Nigel. Now, you can It's clunky. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. I will just very quickly go through the broad principles, no details. It's not the night for detail. But the principles of what, how bushfires affect buildings, and then very quickly, what is the planning, design, construction response before other people talk about the regulations. So, very general. I will be talking and showing diagrams from two very excellent books. I won't try and explain it now, but I just make the point that it is local graphic artist Greg Gall, who is the person that has uh, done these drawings 20 years ago, and still the best to explain the principle. The two books are up there. You can talk to me later if you want. Okay, so the nature of bushfires. How do they affect planning, design, and building? Now, the point is slope. These fires roar up f slopes. The steeper the slope, the bigger the fire, the faster it travels, the greater the, the, frame, sorry, the flame length. 
So if you're near sloping land, immediately, ooh, you're going to have a higher bushfire risk, no matter what. Wind and weather, as you know, we've had remarkable dry period for months, and you know that we've had some of the driest months on record in the Blue Mountains, as well as elsewhere. So of course, everything is pre-dried. And of course, then on those horrible days, like that particular Thursday, the wind becomes our enemy, not our friend. Because the wind is, first of all, what drives the fire. And as you know better than most, that day, sporadic winds, all direction, fire jumping from place to place, unstoppably. OK. And of course, the fuel is the bushland. The bushland that we have hopefully loved but have now, of course, for many people, have been very threatening and problematical. We do not want to see, surely, wholesale land clearance, but certainly proximity of trees, vegetation to buildings is a certainly a major matter that needs to be considered and reconsidered, both in practice and in the regulations. So bushfires attack building in these different ways. In fact, Embers was the particular source of most ignitions in these most recent fires. As the wind carried burning embers, in some cases kilometres, many cases next door or 100 metres, jumping from tree to tree, starting new points of ignition. 85% of destruction and ignitions tends to come from burning embers that can be carried kilometres away from the main fire front. We have to be aware of that and understand that's why even days and weeks after the fire, there are still burning tree stumps, the worry about burning embers. But luckily, that recent rain has hopefully made a difference there. Radiant heat is the next thing, because the fire front comes through in a traditional way, it gets hotter and hotter. And of course, we, or firefighters, can't stand that heat. Our bodies can only take a very low amount of direct radiant heat at us. And of course, building materials can be very much affected, some much more than others. Flame contact. If you're on top of a slope, as well as having the radiant heat, driven by winds, it's too easy to have direct flame impinging, particularly on eaves and gutters and fascias up high. And in many cases, also down low in terms of timber decks and stairs and things like that, which is why flame contact is one of the key concerns of building regulation when it comes to um, bushfire resistant design. Wind. Obviously, strong drying winds contributed bushfires. And as I said, erratic winds spread embers. They can hold embers against window ledges, against eave, even the ignitions that come from doormats. All these little details become problematical if you're trying to be bushfire safer. But of course, there's no guarantees. Certainly, the principles for redesign when it comes to, to building is really to do with how you are sited in relationship to the land, to the topography, the type of vegetation, the orientation, and the like. The issue is that, obviously, the flatter land the, is better than steep land, and obviously, along ridges and saddles is inherently more difficult to be bushfire safe. Landscaping means we have to get, look again at the type of vegetation and the flammability characteristics when it is near our house. Because in some cases, we can use particular kinds of vegetation to shelter our house and protect our house, whereas often a lot of eucalypts and everyday vegetation in the mountains can contribute. So that is a key area that needs to be considered. And of course, you'll be hearing more about bushfire attack level. I'm not going to explain it here and now, but this is the regulatory way of trying to draw these factors together and then give indication of what kind of building construction and design is appropriate. And it is certainly the kind of thing that you will possibly need expert assistance, although it is very noteworthy that the RFS and Council is giving you the upfront advice to assist in this rebuilding recovery effort. So building design. Obviously, I could spend hours, but I'll only spend minutes on this. For bushfire, simple floor plans. 
Simple roof lines. Look at sheltering defendable space and eliminate points of weakness, particularly from ember attack. Because if you look at the building at the bottom, how many of our homes, my own included, I live in a 100-year-old home, it is very vulnerable for all those points with numbers and red where bushfire embers, flame and the like can very readily ignite. And of course, I still haven't removed the timber from my timber veranda, the wood fire, have I? And yet, obviously, you and I need to do that as a matter of urgency. Materials. Certainly non-combustible externally, particularly when you move from medium to high to extreme fire risk, it's very, very important. But you can't say one material's good and another's bad. It depends. So that's a point of further discussion. Windows and doors are frequently the point of greatest weaknesses, apart from gaps and cracks. And of course, you'll find the regulations required you to have toughened glass. When you get up to very high bowel levels or flame zone, you do need to have shutters, usually of metal, or stainless steel, uh, crim safe, security safe type um, screens over the glazing. And of course, that is unfortunately a very expensive part of rebuilding these days. All kinds of roofs must have sarking, a waterproofing and fire resistant layer beneath. But personally, I would never use tiles, my personal choice. The regulations, however, do allow you to have tiles. It's just there are more gaps and cracks to be had. So it's increasing the potential vulnerabilities. Plastic roof windows, forget it. Not suitable whatsoever. Maybe you can use the metal with toughened glass. They go to bowel 40. In all bushfire zones now, the eaves must be enclosed. They must become fire resistant. And of course, part of this is higher wind loadings because high winds are associated with bushfires and big ones can even create their own wind conditions. Wall construction, a whole range of materials is suitable, but obviously when you move up to the higher extreme and flame zone, then it, in, there's certain key requirements about non-combustibility. And of course, all the way through, no gaps, no cracks. And there is an Australian standard, a testing regime, what's called Australian Standard 1530.8. I won't bore you with it. But in many cases, you have to have materials which have been tested to that standard to meet that standard, particularly when you're getting up to flame zone, which frankly is what many of the destroyed houses will be when they're above a western slope or gully. Floors, underfloors, obviously non-combustible is good. Combustible may or may not be permitted depending on your particular situation. And certainly open subfloors or elevated and in timber is problematical. Yes, some hardwoods are okay, but the general point is problematical, more difficult. Same with verandas and decks. I won't try and explain. Timber posts, well, in timber posts in most areas, you must have the bottom part in metal. So, of course, it raises the question, should you have metal, or sorry, timber posts at all? We need to look very carefully at that because there are so many ignitions from low, from fires, even from mulch burning at the base of buildings around timbers, decks and poles. And if the firefighters aren't there, that's when it takes off and becomes uncontrollable. And maintenance. A vital matter. Regulations don't control. I've just admitted to my floor with my own house and I've got to move those timbers away from my veranda. These are the things we all need to do. And also be aware that what you plant now, which is fabulous and only a metre high, what will it be like in five and ten years? Will the regrowth of native vegetation, instead of being your friend, get to be a problem for you in future times when unfortunately the next big bushfire inevitably will come through different parts of the mountains. So that's just a very, very brief run through of principles to try and just get you to understand why some of the following regulations do apply. But I thank you for that and uh, there's a whole range of building professionals here tonight and we have a good scheme to assist you in future weeks that can be discussed later. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Now, are there any burning, burning questions for Nigel before we move on? Yes, we do have one. Can I just hold you to ask a minute? On a minute. Do I have a runner for a microphone?
Council put any thought into what we do in terms of the rules on cut and fill? Because cut and fill is an issue if we're not running if we're not running heightened buildings. Yes, the council will be taking a fairly uh, fairly practical. Yes, the council will be taking a fairly practical approach and to to the extent of cut and filled allowed. It, in some cases, it will require a variation to a development standard, but the council will be taking a practical approach. If there's a cut and fill restriction, I'll, I'll just repeat that for the people in the other room. The question was asked, what about when there's a section 88B restriction on the title of the land that restricts the extent of cut and fill, say to a maximum of a metre or thereabouts? Again, in those cases, the council will take a practical view. In most of those cases, the council is nominated on the section 88B restriction as the authority that it's empowered to vary, release or modify that particular uh, section 88B. And again, we will take a practical view. Excellent. OK, so... Thanks. So what is happening is that the roving mic is not um, streaming into the Macquarie Room, so we will keep sending the roving, right, roving mic round, but then the speaker will repeat the question so that the people in the Macquarie Room can hear the, speak, the question as well as the answer. I'm going to ask Michelle Streeter now, who is the team leader for development assessment and the planning officer for the Rural Fire Service, and she's going to talk to you about planning for the bushfire BAL rating. Now you have to really lift that up. Thanks, Lucy. As she said, my name is Michelle Streeter, and I'm the team leader of development assessment and planning for the Rural Fire Service in the central New South Wales area. The officers that deal with this, with development assessment, are responsible for liaising with local councils and state agencies to ensure that bushfire protection measures are incorporated into development on bushfire prone land. We're working very closely with council um, to assist. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. We're working very closely with council in order to, to help the recovery stage. So I'm very briefly going to run through some information on what you need to know about rebuilding in a bushfire prone area and what tools are available um, to help you with that. So the Rural Fire Service is working with council to ensure... No worries, thanks. ..to ensure that applications are fa fast-tracked we will be offering a pre-development application advice available at the Springwood Reco Recovery Centre and we will be conducting site-specific inspections if required and we'll have officers there. We'll have a number of officers working in the team to process these very quickly and we'll also have officers available at that recovery centre um, to assist in completing the bushfire documentation. We've also prepared an indicative bow plan and please um, I stress that this is just an indicative bow plan. It's available at the back and we'll also have it available on our, on our website as of Monday. What is, what is a bow plan? Yep. A bushfire, th this plan is showing what your indicative bushfire attack level or your construction level is um, in, in the areas that have been affected. So that's available on on the back wall, and this is only indicative. More thorough and site-specific um, information will be available as part of the recovery process at Springwood. So what are the key planning documents? The bushfire prone land mapping is a trigger for development so when you lodge a development application, this is only a trigger to ensure that bushfire protection measures are incorporated into your development application. Planning for bushfire protection is the, one of the key documents and this provides more information on um, building in a bushfire prone area and the types of things that you need to incorporate into your development. 
The Australian Standard 3959 deals with construction of buildings in bushfire prone areas. This gives more specific information on what types of materials and what kind of uh, requirements you need to incorporate into the construction. And the Rural Fire Service also has practice notes and fast facts available on our website for more information on specific things. So planning for bushfire protection is the main document that it, and it's intrinsic in fire management to facilitate a safer community. It deals with land use planning and building control, controls on bushfire prone land. This is currently being reviewed to um, address anomalies um, and most there, there are different types of development identified within this document. Most of the development applications that you will be lodging will be classified as infill development. This Infill development deals with existing subdivisions that were approved prior to bushfire legislation coming in and this means that all lots that are within those existing development just need to incorporate bushfire protection measures and they will not be refused because they are existing. So there are a, diff a number of different types of development. The predominant one is what we call infill, and this is Section 79BA of the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act. So there are two different paths that you can go down. There is the acceptable solution or the deemed to satisfy approach, which is what most of your applications will be, or there is an alternate solution. So if you do not meet one of the criteria as said, set out in build, planning for bushfire protection, then alternate solution to meeting that. As I said, most of the applications that you will be putting forward will be an acceptable solution and you'll be able to submit minimal documentation in order to process these. The other type of development, I understand that there, there were a um, few other types of development that were affected by the fires and these are classified as special fire protection purpose development and they go down a different path. So these include things like schools, childcare centres, hospitals or tourist accommodation and the focus here is on larger asset protection zones to allow for vulnerable occupants to access and egress the site. Section 79BA, um, which is your likely path, deal, you, you need to ensure that you in, uh, are compliant with planning for bushfire protection 2006. So these include things like single dwellings in those existing subdivisions, alterations and additions, sheds, <laughs> carports and garages, Council and the Rural Fire Service uh, have been working together and the Rural Fire Service has done a lot of training with councils to ensure that they can actually incorporate a lot of these bushfire protection me measures dependent on the risk to the property. So council are able to process these applications for bushfire attack levels of 12.5, 19 and 29. However, if they are bushfire attack level 40 or flame zone, they will be referred to the Rural Fire Service or if you are proposing an alternate solution to one of the bushfire protection measures. So what do you have to address as infill development for planning for bushfire protection? This includes things like siting and design, asset protection zones, construction levels, access, utilities and landscaping. So as Nigel pointed out in his previous uh, presentation, this includes, for siting and design, it includes things like simple building design and simple roof design. For asset protection zones, this, this works well with construction levels. So the greater asset protection zone that you can provide on your site, the lower the construction level is. Obviously this is dependent on the vegetation and how close that is to your, your proposed dwelling. There are a number of documents available um, and there's some up the back and they have, we have them on our website as well that can assist you in, in dealing this, with this. In regards to asset protection zones, as part of your development application, we can only specify the distance that you need to um, create an asset protection zone, but it is your responsibility for the maintenance of it. We do provide guidelines in planning for bushfire protection and also standards for asset protection zones on the maintenance but you need to ensure that you do maintain this area to ensure that it's clear of vegetation or minimal vegetation. 
In regards to access, the existing access for, for most of these applications will be accepted. However, if you do have a battle axe block, um, we will look at that to ensure that vegetation isn't overhanging that access as well. For utilities, water, gas and electricity, this incorporates things like if there is unreliable water source, then you need to provide water tanks. So whilst there is reticulated water, um, during an emergency, quite often that water um, can fail. So we do recommend that you have water tanks on your property. For gas, um, this incorporates things like keeping gas cylinders, if you're proposing to have gas cylinders there, keeping them away from combustible, combustibles and having metal fittings. And I'll cover landscaping a little bit further on. So how is an asset protection zone calculated? This is based on the distance available on site, the slope and the vegetation. Only in ex extenuating circumstances can they be relied upon on adjacent land. So when we're, we're helping to, to um, work out your construction level, we will only be looking at the distance available on your own land unless in ex extenuating circumstances you can ensure that there is a plan of management on adjacent land or get owner's consent from the adjoining landholder to create an easement in accordance with 88B of the Convey Conveyancing Act. There's been a number of questions about when did the standard change. So there, there has been an Australian standard for construction on building in bushfire prone areas since 1999. This incorporated levels one, two, three and flame zone. However, in 2009, because of the Victorian Black Saturday and the Royal Commission, this was expeditedly uh, upgraded and included increased construction requirements. So in May 2010, the Australian standard introduced bow levels and increased the construction. This level is not a land zone. So if, if you hear the term flame zone, it is not a land zone. It is a construction level and it is identified when building which comes back to the bushfire prone land mapping as a trigger for development. This picture gives you an idea of the different levels. So if you have a look, bow low is a low risk um, given the distance to the vegetation. When you get to bushfire attack level 12.5, this is when you'll start to get embers and embers can travel for kilometres, but this is the trigger under the Australian standard at the moment. So this is when you'll start to get embers. Bow 19, or bushfire attack level 19, is when you'll see an increase in embers and debris falling on your property, which can ignite um, elements on your property. Bushfire attack level 29 is when you'll still have that ember attack, but you'll also start to, to feel the radiant heat from the bushfire. Bushfire attack level 40, the, the radiant heat is increased and flame contact may be sustained on your dwelling. Bushfire attack level flame zone is sustained flames and direct exposure to the fire front. So for class 10A structures, this includes sheds, carports and garages. If you are proposing these as part of your development application, if they are greater than 10 metres from your dwelling, they do not require to have construction. That if they are within 10 metres of your dwelling, they require the same level of construction. If, however, in some cases, um, people's sheds are more important than their houses in some cases because they have a lot of investment in them, you can include the construction level required for that. So what are the submission requirements for a development application on bushfire prone land? As I said previously, uh, most of the applications that you will be proposing will be an acceptable solution. The Rural Fire Service has a single dwelling, dwelling application kit available and there's some at the back of the room. We will have them available at the recovery centre and they are available online for download and we can assist in, in helping you fill this document out. And this is the most documentation for bushfire that you will need in most cases. If, however, you are proposing an alternate solution, we recommend that you do engage 
a suitably qualified consultant. And what does this mean? A suitably, suitably qualified consultant is a consultant that's um, recognised by the Fire Protection Association of Australia. They've gone through a graduate diploma in bushfire protection and they can be either a BPAD A or a BPAD D. BPAD A means that they're, they're able to propose alternate solutions and BPAD D means that they're able to propose deemed to satisfy solutions. And there's more information available at the Fire Protection Association of Australia website. So this is the single dwelling application and as I said there are copies at the back. We have some more copies and you can download it from the website and we're more than happy to help you fill that out at the recovery centre. So to fill it out, there's a number of things that you'll need to fill out. The first one, in, in all instances for rebuilding, you will be forest vegetation. Um, the, the next um, thing that you'll need to fill out is the asset protection zone or the distance to the vegetation. This is the distance available on your site. Uh, even if there is land that is managed uh, on another site, this unfortunately can't be counted because we don't know if that will be managed in perpetuity. In saying this, roads or other managed land can be incorporated into that asset protection zone or the distance to, to, oops, sorry, to calculate your construction level. Obviously, a lot of the land surrounding you will be quite steep land and we can assist in calculating what the slope is to determine what your construction level is. For the Blue Mountains, every application will be an FDI of 100. This is a fire danger index and this is calculated on weather conditions in certain areas. So the whole of the Blue Mountains is 100. So this gives you an idea of how to calculate your bushfire attack level. So it deals with your FDI or your fire danger index, the distance to the vegetation, the slope of the land, and the vegetation itself. So if you have a look there, um, I don't know how clear it is, but um, for slopes of 10 to 15 degrees, um, anything 39 metres or less from the vegetation of forest will be within the flame zone. So this gives you an idea of how to calculate your bushfire attack level, but we will have offices at the Springwood Centre. There are other tools to provide extra information on, on other bushfire protection measures. So this is one on water. The Rural Fire Service used to require that it be a dedicated water source for firefighting. We now acknowledge that tanks, pools and dams can also be accessed, but access needs to be provided. So um, where there are rocky outcrops and you have a pool at the bottom, obviously you're not going to be able to access that water, but it does not require to be dedicated. There's also fast facts on things like fences. So at the lower construction levels or the lower bushfire attack levels, you, you may be able to use bushfire resisting or hardwoods. However, at the higher levels, um, Fences can be a source of ignition, and so we do recommend that non-combustible fencing be used. Landscaping is very important. As, as Nigel pointed out, 85% of ignitions in dwellings are from embers, and landscaping can pl play a very important role in that. We do have a number of principles that we incorporate, things like moisture content and oils within those, um, and there's some guidelines on our website. But you, you should also think about things like garden beds under windows. These can catch embers, create an ignition and crack windows. So when you're thinking about landscaping your property, we understand that it is important, but you should incorporate some of these principles. Things like not having mulch as well, that can, that can help in reducing the likelihood of those ignitions. The Rural Fire Service also has best practice guidelines available. All new works are required to meet Australian Standard 3959 for construction in, of buildings in bushfire prone areas. For those 
properties that were damaged, we do have the best practice guidelines available. And this in incorporates things um, to do with upgrading that building and may include things like ceiling gaps and protect protecting against embers. Similar guidelines were developed as part of the Victorian Royal Commission. I know a lot of you will be asking about New South Wales building products or building products in for certain bushfire attack level areas. The RFS is a regulatory authority and we're not able to certify or recommend particular products. However, we do recommend that if you are looking at products that you ask the manufacturer for certificates to say that they do comply with your particular construction level and they need to be tested to certain standards. So for BOW 40, um, because a lot of them, a lot of the properties will be BOW 40 and BOW flame zone, you need to ensure that the products that you are using do comply with the standards. So for bushfire attack level 40, you need to look at 1530.8.1 and for bushfire attack level flame zone, you need to look at 1530.8.2. So if manufacturers have had their products tested to these, they will have certificates to say that they meet those requirements. We also have a number of use, useful documents, um, including the single dwelling application kit. We have frequently asked questions available up the back and we will have them available on our website as of Monday. And as I said previously, we've done an indicative bushfire attack level plan to show what the likely construction level is for your particular property. As I said, this is a very rough plan, but it is available up the back. And we also have a number of um, links on our website as well. We have set up a specific um, email for to fast track this process and any inquiries that you do have you can either call our customer service center on 1300 nsw rfs or you can email your inquiries to the rural fire service at recoveryda at rfs.nsw.gov.au so that's all from me okay so could you just go back one page <laughs> So thanks, Michelle. I just want to confirm, it seemed to me that that document planning for bushfire protection and the best practice guide would going to be pretty important. They're going to be available at the service centre that Council and the RFS are setting up? Um, they are available for download on the website, those particular ones, um, and we will have copies for reference okay. at the service centre. Okay. Um, are they very thick documents? They are. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I think, I, I, yeah, I think it's, it's would it be possible for the RFS to have cop? I think that those copies need to be available. <laughs> Phil agrees with it. They need to be available in hard copy yep. at the service centre. The service centre is not at the recovery centre, which you mentioned before. It's actually going to be at Council Springwood um, offices, but I'm going to give you more details about that right now. Did everybody understand uh, what Michelle was saying, particularly about the issues of the the bowel, the, the fire zones and those kind of things. Did you have any clarifying questions you wanted to ask now before we move on? Yes, we've got one question here. Just very quickly, um, you mentioned that um, the uh, FDI was 100. On uh, the RFS's website, uh, there's a little known calculator for, for calculating bowel levels and APZ uh, distances. Um, when you punch in Blue Mountain City Council, it comes up as 80 and not 100. That obviously makes a big difference in the calculation. So is 80 correct? So just so that the Macquarie Room could, could hear, apparently on the RFS website, the FDI is rated at 80 for the Blue Mountains, but Michelle said it was 100, and we're just seeking clarification. We have actually taken those calculators off our website because we are reviewing them and they they did have some anomalies. Okay, well, the, the FDI for the Blue Mountains is definitely 100. Okay, excellent. Yep. So there's a couple of questions up the back. Just wait till we get a mic for you, please. With the bell ratings, the entire property gets one bell rating or dependent on distances at different walls, they get different bowel ratings, so therefore you can use 
different requirements. The question is, does a property get one bowel rating or do they you know, several you know, due, due to different walls? So the bushfire attack level is determined on the distance. So if the elevation closest to the vegetation is flame zone, the back elevation may have the ability to downgrade to bow 40, but it is the distance from the dwelling to the vegetation. Does that answer your question? So it could have two. So it, it could have two bow levels, but we can help you in incorporating that into your documentation. Um, so if, for instance, the the elevation closest to the vet to the vegetation is flame zone, there is the ability for the elevation furthest away from the vegetation to be downgraded to bow 40. Okay, yep, the next question, yep. Yeah, we'll come to you, sir. Don't fiddle with the mic. Why do they fiddle with the mic? <laughs> Why don't they just leave the mic? My question, my question deals probably more for council. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, land, especially the larger blocks that are zoned environmentally protected. They've got an environmental protection zone. Will council now allow that those zones to be cleared? Yeah, okay. So the question is, there's a lot of blocks that back onto Council's fire um, asset protection zone. Environmental, environmental protection. There's a lot of land going onto Council's environmental protection zone. Will you now allow that land to be cleared? Uh, the planning instruments uh, already allow clearing for the purpose of bushfire hazard uh, reduction and asset protection zones that are needed to meet the bushfire re protection requirements in environmental protection zone. I'm not, I'm not hearing the Would it be fair to say that all the properties that were damaged by a fire would be, would be classified as flame zone? So the question is would all of the properties be classified as flame zone? Yeah. That's what I heard, yeah. Not necessarily. As I said, 85% of ignitions are from embers, um, whilst there are a significant number that are within bow flame zone and bow 40, um, some of them may not be that. Yeah, I think it's 100 feet. So the question is, is there any calculations on the likely cost that it would take to rebuild to bowel 40 or bowel flame zone? This question is probably best directed to a, a builder or an architect. Obviously, it will de be dependent on what kind of house that you are proposing to rebuild, a modest house versus a larger house. The cost will be dependent on that and also the amount of windows. Windows can be um, quite often a large amount of that extra money. Um, obviously, it will cost more to build in flame zone or 40, but it will depend on the design of your house. Okay, so, so I'll just take that as a statement, which is that it's an estimate that it's 115,000 for a bowel 40. Okay, the next question, please. In relation to landscaping, um, copper, the um, retaining walls using the copper logs, um, they were very prone to um, fire damage or catching a light and destroying houses and things. Um, the insurance companies are asking um, if you have a house or I had a house with a retaining wall with copper logs. They want to put copper logs back there. It's been rated as an FZ zone. So are you asking if that's suitable? OK, so the question is about the copper logs being used for um, retaining walls. The insurance company wants to use the same thing for a retaining wall. And the question is, is that actually appropriate in a FZ bowel zone? We would recommend that any retaining walls would be non-combustible, so we would recommend um, things like brickwork and blockwork. Right. 
That's a good question. The question is, is that a recommendation of the RFS or part of the standard because the insurance companies will build to the standard? The standard doesn't actually deal with things like retaining walls and fences, so it is a recommendation, but it is highly recommended by the Rural Fire Service. Okay, so, so is there something All you right. could do about that in terms of talking with the insurance companies? Can you say that? The Rural Fire Service can have a conversation with the Insurance Council in, in dealing with that issue. So, so what I'm hearing is the Rural Fire Service is hearing your concern about that response, that the insurance companies might actually just go to the, um, to the recommended level and that they will take that up with the Insurance Council. And I understand, Phil, you're having ongoing conversations with the Insurance Council, as was said earlier, just to make sure that we can resolve some of these issues. I can see this man here. I'm not quite sure where the squeaky microphone is. Exxon, can you ask your question, sir? Yeah, my question relates to um, the increased cost to uh, the people that have lost their homes to comply with the the standards and my question is not only directed to the RFS but also perhaps to Mr Kaperberg in what uh, is the possibility that of some funding from the government to meet the difference because these people that have lost their homes are insured for a certain amount to now comply yeah, with be. the regulations that have come in subsequent to them building their homes yep. it's a cost that no one's foreseen yep that they're not insured for, and it's a big cost. So the question is for the Macquarie Room. <laughs> and as you can... As you can hear, it's a question that's supported by most people in the room. It's concerning the shortfall that owners have in terms of rebuilding to the new standards, which were not in place when they purchased or built, and Mr Koperberg's going to respond to it. Thanks, Lucy. Um, as I said at the outset, this is going to be the, the this is going to be the predominant <clears throat> but the predominant challenge. Uh, on average, if you are in Bell 40 or Flame Zone, the cost of replacing what you had is going to be somewhere between 80 to possibly 120 thousand dollars more than you would have paid in the first. It depends on the design, but as a ballpark, somewhere between 80 and 120. The cost of the glazing required is $4,000 per square metre. The cost of shutters, the roof design and materials, all of these add up to roughly those figures. The short answer is the government going to make uh, uh, some uh, provision for that shortfall? The answer is no. Um, but I will be speaking to the finance industry in the next week or two, certainly the big mortgage uh, brokers and lenders, to facilitate some sort of arrangement whereby that shortfall might be incorporated in existing or future mortgages at an interest rate which is commensurate with the, with the circumstances which are currently prevailing. Again, these are discussions still to be had. They haven't been had, and therefore I cannot commit the, the banking industry or lenders to any such arrangement, but I want to explore what the options are in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Koberg, for that answer. And this is 2013. And this document was produced in 2002, and you're now having discussions? Uh, that, that's because we had the fire on October the 17th. Um, yes, but, the, but it wasn't foreseen when this document was produced that something might happen? So this is the RFS's guides to single dwellings, is it? Well, uh, for those of you who are present at the um, insurance forum on Tuesday night, you heard me say that amongst my many recommendations following this episode will be one uh, that might be incorporated in the code of practice for the insurance industry to ensure that the insured uh, is made aware of the fact that should destruction take place, the replacement cost is going to be higher and should be told the insurance options available to them. Okay, so this lady with the white hair here, yes, yeah, she's standing up. What I want to say is that I live in my, on my property for 42 years. 
I lived through many, many fires in Springwood. What I want to know is my blog is back in its had a reserve back to the back fence of my house. I keep my house very clean, very tidy. If you look on the web, it's number nine Buena Vista Road. You look at Google Map, my house is surrounded by all grass like a golf course. What my question is, and I also got a 10,000 gallon water tank and very, very clear block. When the fire happened on the 17th of October, it took less than 20 minutes from the fire, flew across from Emma, Emma Parade onto my block. Yeah. What I want to know is, since I'm back into a reserve, why this council has not done anything for the last 20 years to keep my gully clean? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the, the question was, just from the quarry room, the question was from a resident in Buena Vista um, Road who has lost her home. She had a very cleared large block and she's asking why the um, council-owned land behind her property had not been uh, managed for some time. Council has a network of asset protection zones that it does put in place where residential development uh, adjoins our bushland. In that particular instance, the distance off achieved by the dwelling didn't necessitate the construction of an asset protection zone, that, that's the circumstance that prevails. Yeah, they don't understand what you said. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, 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 hang on, hang on. Yes. Where a number of tenures adjoin residential development throughout the mountains, including council land, national park, crown land, Council certainly has uh, an obligation to manage bushfire risk uh, to adjoining land, as do lands adjoining ours. The way we deal with that generally is we have an asset protection zone program. We uh, invest in that program on a prioritised basis where we can achieve um, a reduction in fire threat by managing vegetation adjoining the land. We do. It's done on a site-by-site -site assessment. I understand that in the particular circumstance uh, that's being raised, it was assessed that an APZ uh, wasn't required. Okay, okay I've, just, I've got a question here from the Macquarie Room, which I'm gonna ask just because, and I think, Nick, you'll have to answer it too, yeah. which is, will we be allowed to clear exis existing vegetation to help create asset protection zones to reduce the bowel levels on our property? Mm -hmm. Uh, Council's very keen to adopt a, a common sense approach. As I said earlier, it's not just council land that adjoins um, residential development and indeed other properties throughout the mountains. It requires a multi-tenure approach. The best way to do that is for council to explore those policy options because that policy... <laughs> with the Bushfire Management Committee, the Bushfire Management Committee is made up of council, national parks, Crown Lands, Aboriginal Land Councils, most of the managers of bushland that adjoins residential development in the mountains sit on the Bushfire Management Committee. It requires a holistic approach where we develop a policy between us. It's no point in dealing with one land manager. It's very important that the approach adopted is adopted by all land managers. Okay, so yeah, so we're, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure where the squeaky mic microphone is. Excellent. So the man over there in holding the folder, and then the hand in the. Yes, that man there. Thank you. <laughs> I could just sorry, sir. I could just see your hand. No, no, sorry. Um, when you look at uh, partially damaged properties, uh, where is the line drawn uh, for upgrading the damaged sections to the new bell levels? You know, where does that start and stop? And. Uh, yeah, yeah, get it. So the question was about ma ma about where is the line drawn with partly damaged buildings and the bowel assessment and here is someone. Only, is it only the damaged section that needs to be upgraded right. or where do you start and stop? Okay, so when you've got a partly damaged home, do you only have to repair the damaged bit to the, the new standards or is it the whole thing? 
No, it's not. When you have, when you have, a, have part of a property damaged, the new work must be brought up to the current standard. So you must build the new work up to, up to, under the, to, to comply with the current Australian standard. Whether the entire building is, needs, to, needs to be upgraded, we would not normally ask for the existing work to work to be, if, if that's structurally adequate and is not being changed, we would not normally ask for that to be upgraded. Just the new work must comply. Okay, that man with his hand up. Firstly, I'd like to thank you very, very much for having this very informative evening. We really appreciate it. And it's good that we can all uh, participate and share in the information at the same time. Uh, just following on from the RFS in, in terms of uh, the, the bowel and the cladding uh, and the vegetation, etc. Uh, mine's sort of a dummy's question, I guess. Uh, in terms of the, the frame of the building, timber versus metal, is there any particular preference or requirement uh, or it doesn't really matter. The question is about the framing for new buildings. Is it preferred to have timber or, or metal or does it really matter? Essentially, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the metal will uh, warp and distort at 500 odd degrees. By the time the temperatures reach that point inside, the building's gone anyway. So once again, it's the external fabric, non-combustibility and all these other things with bowel ratings. Excellent. Now, I, this, I've got a man up the back whose arm is falling off because he's had it up so long. <laughs> I haven't forgotten you, sir. <laughs> Yeah, I just had a uh, question for the gentleman uh, who answered a question uh, about five minutes ago regarding removal of vegetation for bowel levels. Um, yep. Just in regards to, you know, coming to a consensus with various age, Aboriginals, RFS Council, there's no real right or wrong answers to tree removal, yes or no, because people's insurance money are not covering them to rebuild a home because of bowel levels that could go into an eighty or $120,000 premium. When will they know whether they can remove trees to immediately give them that sort of leeway and sort of that way they're saving up to from eighty to $120,000? Okay, so the question is for the Macquarie Room, when will um, homeowners know when they can remove trees or whether the other agency is going to remove trees so it can reduce the bowel level? Um, Nick, are you the right person to answer that? No? Yes? No? Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated question, but it's the question people want answered. I, I'll respond in terms of council land. In terms of council land, I, I just want to reiterate that we're a member of the Bushfire Management Committee. I imagine that we're going to be meeting very soon to look at this issue. Council will be a very cooperative and flexible player in that, where we can help. But it is a multi-tenure issue, I have to stress that, that the bushland throughout the city that adjoin um, residential development, there are many different owners, including significant areas of bushland owned privately. Uh, so y yes, my understanding is Council is very open to looking at flexible policy options, but it has to be done in a holistic way. Okay, so I, look, I'm sensing some frustration in the room. <laughs> you can tell I'm a professional. Um, <laughs> so, so I think I think a couple of things. I think number one that there's some that it's not easy to give a lot of clear answers to this. And I think that what Nick is trying to say is that we're in the middle of a situation where, for a number of reasons, it is hard to make blanket um, you know observations about the asset protection zones and how they're managed. But there is a commitment, including, and I know from Phil and the Premier, that that changes need to be made to make those things easier. Council is trying to work out and work with the relevant state bodies to get there um, and, and, and other landowners because it's not a simple just a council issue or a state government issue. Now, th <laughs> um, okay, so um, this man down here has a question 
And I'm, I'm just anxious to get on to that last presentation. So, so can you ask your question? I think we've got another one from the Macquarie Room too, yes? Yeah, a couple of things. The, the, the first one is I live on a road uh, in Mount, Mount Irvine, um, not very well looked after, and um, the, the trees have been trimmed on the road, but some very large black stumps are right on the road. And I asked a tree fellow who was there why he didn't move them. He said they were heritage stumps. <laughs> now, now, I thought that was a, a new one, but, uh, well, you know, they're very dangerous because they're very black and in the middle of the night you're going to have a problem. Okay. So, so if we could deal with the heritage stumps, I'd love that. But uh, my, my real question is related to this extra cost for uh, my house was demolished totally by the state mine fire. And I believe that... Um, fire to have been started by the Defence Department, um, although they haven't actually formally admitted that at this point in time, but surely my there should be a claim from me to them to pick up that extra cost. cost. Okay, so there was just for the Macquarie Room, there were two things. There was an observation that some stumps were not being removed because they were heritage, and, and Nick assures me that he's going to take that question on notice and investigate it. Uh, but the other question was about... Um, about the people who had lost their homes as a result of the state mine fires and surely that they had a case to ask the Defence Department to help make up at least that extra cost in rebuilding. Um, are you able to? Yeah. Uh, firstly, I'm the only heritage stump in this room. Um, um, and, and secondly, um, there is no uh, reason why if an individual homeowner having lost their property wants to engage in civil litigation against um, the, the uh, cause of the fire or those agencies believed to be, once that's been determined, it hasn't been determined yet by the way, but once it is determined, uh, as is the case Australia-wide, uh, there is that option uh, to litigate against uh, the entity uh, which was responsible for starting the fire. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Phil. Look, I'm going to move on with the presentation just because I've got you all in the room and I know what happens is that pretty soon some of you are going to feel that you've been here too long, you're going to start drifting away and you won't have got to the bit about the service centre and I want you to hear about that, particularly um, homeowners and also because I think that there's going to be some information in there which is going to be of use. So I'm now going to pass on to... Hang on a minute. I've got... Chris. And can we have the air conditioning made cooler, please? It's getting really hot in here. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry, Chris. Right. You've got to point it at their laptop. Yeah. I can do it. Though. No, that's right. No, it's all right. Hello. Uh, my name's Chris Brogan. I'm from the Building and Construction uh, Branch of the Council. It's my team that will be dealing with, the, um, with your DAs and CCs if you elect, elect with Council. You've heard from Nigel uh, regarding the, the design principles for buildings and we've heard from Michelle from the RFS regarding the requirements for building on, on bushfire prone, prone land. What's the next step? And that's what the, what the council is hoping to, to assist you with. First of all, um, we will be establishing a dedicated uh, development assessment team and advisory team down at the Springwood, Springwood office. That will be from Monday the 18th of, of, of November. For those that don't know where the uh, Springwood Library or the, the office is, the, you will access it through the Springwood Library at the front, the front counter. It's, um, the, the office will be open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Each, um, each, each weekday. We do encourage appointments rather than just people walking up. Um, we will then re be reviewing the, the operation of that and the hours of operation in response to customer needs. We just need to assess what, they, what the best way to respond to the customer needs is before we, can, we, before we vary that. There will also be, in the, be the opportunity for those that are from the Mount, Mount Victoria and the, and the Lithgow Mines Fire to make appointments to speak to the officers and receive advice up at the Katoomba office. We will be working with the RFS in those, in those uh, consultations and, and the meetings with the, with the people. In that regard, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the uh, efforts of Penrith Council. They've give, um, loaned us a couple of staff members, so we have the um, staff available to man that office. So I'd just like, like to acknowledge the assistance of Penrith. 
Um, we will be prepared to take, we'll be undertaking site inspections on, on with, the, with owners. Um, we will meet with their, with their architects, their, their building designers, uh, their builders, so who, whoever they wish to meet, meet us with. We can undertake those inspections prior to 10, 10 a.m. of morning. We can undertake those from 8 a.m. in the morning or thereabouts, late afternoon, if it, suits, if it better suits, suits people. Part of that pre-lodgement pre advice is to identify, identify the issues on your land that are going to impact upon the, upon the development. So the, the advice will be tailored for your land. We'll also assist, together with the RFS, in giving you advice on what the bowel rating is for your particular block. The other area we will, we will be able to provide assistance with is with, um, with, with the vegetation uh, management on sites. The, if you need to lodge a DA and you have some e endangered ecological communities, threatened species vegetation on the site, at the, now that all that vegetation has, has been burnt, it's going to be almost impossible for um, anybody to tell what that is. The council's um, environmental scientists um, have, have records of what that, that uh, vegetation there and will happily um, undertake that environmental assessment on, on your behalf rather than, making, rather than requiring applicants to obtain uh, detailed fauna and flora reports from, from, from consultants. They will also help prepare concept landscape plans. They can do that over the counter to, to, to assist you with preparing the documentation that you need. Council also has some, has some significant mapping uh, resources available that you are able to access from the council, council's website. Furthermore, the, the, our landscape assessment and environmental scientist officers are prepared to meet with people on site to give them advice as to the best way to manage the, ve the vegetation, what trees should be removed, what, what trees should be, should be uh, retained. That can be done during the week, it can be done um, on weekends. It will all, they will also meet just not with individuals, but if there are a group of residents that wish to receive some advice on regarding the management of vegetation on a number of lots to improve, improve the asset management or the asset, the asset protection zones on those, on those lots, they will meet with those, with those groups of people. Okay, thank you. The council, uh, Councillor Lachetti also indicated earlier that the council had resolved on, on Tuesday night to, to waive and, and, and reduce a range of development application and other related fees. Some of those fees um, include the pre-lodgement pre advice fee. All, all those, any pre-lodgement meetings in bushfire affected areas will, will be done at no charge to the, to the homeowner. The council's also resolved to waive the section 94 uh, co contributions. They are actually considerable um, fees on, so a $400,000, $300,000 house, that's about a $3,000 uh, waiving of the fee. Um, the whole... <laughs> Council's also uh, resolved to, to waive any associated road application fees with it, if should, as part of the rebuilding exercise, you need to open up the road to connect stormwater, gas, uh, water supply, sewerage, etc. And finally, any tree removal applications that uh, that um, any homeowner that's affected by the by the fires wishes to remove, again, those applications will be done free of charge. The whole idea here is the de the development application process is highly highly regulated. It is certainly complex. The council must follow certain legal requirements. But our, our aim is to reduce the the costs and time for you both in preparing the documentation that's required to be submitted and also in the assessment time that we, we will take to, to, to process those applications. Part of, the, part of that other assistance will be the, the as the, uh, Michelle had indicated, the RFS will be um, accepting the, their pro forma, um, pro forma bushfire reports rather than have to get a costly report done externally. The, the RFS has agreed to accept those. Similarly, with concept landscape plans, we, we will not require detailed plans, they'll be just fairly basic, and as, as I indicated earlier, our staff can, can assist with those. So it moves on to the next, uh, next part, then is, now that you do have to rebuild, what approvals are you going, going to require? 
That's going to depend on when your house was built and how you wish to, wish to, 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 to rebuild. There's essentially three, three streams. There's those development consents that were issued after May 2010. Those that were issued between 1980 and uh, 2010 and those that, were, that were, were issued prior to 1980. Those that were issued um, after 1st of May 2010, they're the most recent ob applications obviously. They incorporate the current building standards. If you do not w wish to make any changes to your building or to your development, your site, etc., you will only need a building approval, what's called a, a construction certificate that can be obtained either from a private accredited certifier or you can, uh, uh, or you can approach council and council will issue those, those particular certificates. If you wish to undertake changes to your building, you will need either a new DA or you'll need to modify your development application. And again, you also will need your building approval. Those applications that were, or the houses that were built between 1980 and April 2010, for all those applications, anything that was built in the 1980s and 1990s is likely to have minimal bushfire protection measures. Since that time, the understanding and knowledge of bushfires and their behaviour has, has evolved significantly. Whilst you, if you're not undertaking any changes to your building or to the development, whilst you won't, may only need a construction certificate, Council strongly encourages, the take, encourages you to take this opportunity to upgrade your building, build to a safer house, together with any other improvements that you may wish to include, such as another bathroom, a larger room, etc., take this opportunity. It's also an efficient and cost-effective way to address changes to the construction standards. As Michelle indicated in her, her, her talk earlier, there's, there's two ways to comply with the, with, um, with the Australian standard for building in bushfire-prone areas and the Building Code of Australia. One is what they call the deemed to satisfy. It's like following a recipe. You just go through the, the, through the particular standard, providing you comply, it's okay. The other way is an alternate solution. The alternate solution is going to require you to obtain um, a detailed bushfire assessment report. It will also require you to, require, uh, also require you to submit uh, a further report to your certifier demonstrating that that meets the performance requirements of the, of the Building Code of Australia. By lodging a development application and having the matter, if it's in, a, in, in the flame zone, referred to the RFS, it opens up the opportunity for you to just use the deemed to satisfy five, five provisions and not have to go through or obtain those, um, those detailed uh, bushfire reports. The final, the final, um, uh, I'll change that. The final category of, of applications is those that were pr approved prior to 1980. Unfortunately, you only have one choice there. You must go through the, a new DA process and, and a new CC. But again, it's, there is significant benefits for you. You get the opportunity to build your house back better and, and incorporate any other changes you wish to, you wish to make. So that's, that's, that's effectively it. If I've got any questions, I'm happy to answer. So this one isn't for you? No, it's, it's already been covered. Hang on, let's get, you, let's get your microphone because we can't hear. They, they still got to build, build it well, to the new standard. On the dwellings 1990 to 2010, if you put in a new DA, will you be forced? Will you be forced to comply with LEP 2005? For the for the benefit of the other room, the question was, for those applications that that were initially approved between 1980 and and 2010, if if you lodge a new if you lodge a new new application, will you have to comply with the um, the provisions of uh, LEP 2005? The answer is is a yes. You will need to, need to comply with the with the provisions. But once again, council will will try to take a fl as flexible approach as possible. Could you point out to uh, the people?
assembled what the differences would be between what they had as a home and what LEP 2005 may force them to do. The question was, um, for, the, for the people assembled, could, could I point out the difference between an for a dwelling approved under the previous LEPs prior to 1980 and, uh, and LEP 2005? Unfortunately, it's, it, it's like saying how long's a piece of string. There are significant changes. It's just too hard to identify a, a specific change without, uh, without knowing the specifics of the development. She's saying can't hear you. Say, yeah, they're saying they can't hear you. Yes, have you got the microphone, sir? Excellent. Chris, it goes to a question of um, a building that we like. We've loved living in it for years. Um, it's got timber cladding and it's on piers. We wanted to change it so it's got um, fibre cement sheeting and slab on ground. Is that a new DO or just a new CC? The, the question for the other room was if they have a, if someone has, a, has an existing dwelling that they like that might be, uh, might be timber clad up on piers, and they want to change that to fibre cement cladding and, uh, and a slab on ground, ground construction, is that a new DA or just the CC? That would be either a new DA or you could modify your, your, your existing DA. Depending on when it was built. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's a woman down the front here. So yeah, catch that man on the way and then we'll come to the woman at the front. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your efforts with the service centre. It sounds like a great idea. Uh, when it kicks off on the 18th of November, do you have any idea of how many applicants you can process per day? Because Christmas, of course, is upon us and a lot of people would like to be along the way before that date comes up. The question was, um, with, 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 with the approach of Christmas in the, in the, in the uh, assistance centre at Springwood, will we be, how many people do we envisage would be able to process each day? Um, we, we, we would be... Ex we will have two or three staff in that in that office. It will take a, a week or two to come up to up to speed. After that that time, we would expect to be able to make appointments for for approximately one hour each. So we'd be looking at in, in within a couple of weeks, uh, twenty odd people a day. Hi, can you tell us what the requirements are for sheds or garages more than ten metres from the principal dwelling? The question was, can, can, I, can I explain the, what the requirements are for sheds and garages that are more than 10, 10 metres from the dwelling? Under planning for, bushfire, planning for bushfire protection and the Australian standard, for garages, sheds and other outbuildings more than 10 metres away, there are no, no specific requirements. Speaker, haven't we? Uh -huh. Yeah, we have. I think from the. Um, yeah. So what I might do is make this the last yeah. one, and I'll say that. Yeah, okay. Just say that. Mm. G'day, Chris. Um, I understand there's a new LEP that's about to be exhibited around December 4th, which combines both LEP 2005 and LEP 1991 into one LEP. If the draft's exhibited, it has to be taken into account with any new DA. Um, will that new LEP come into play? The question was: um, the council has, or the council has, a, has a new LEP that combines both LEP4 and 1991 into place. Um, will that be taken? Into, will, be, will that be considered as part of the assessment of these uh, these applications? The answer is that LEP is the standard instrument LEP that the government has required council to convert its existing LEPs to. They will need to be taken into account, but most of the provisions and the policy are a simple translation across to the to the new standard to the new standard instrument template. Just um, we've got one more speaker to, to go. I might just uh, let the next speaker go, and then we're happy to answer any questions after that. Excellent. So, so. We've got Norm Foster from not sorry, yeah, Norm Foster, who's the principal building inspector at the Department of Fair Trading. So, Norm, over to you. Here he comes. You'll have to hold it up, I'm afraid. That's okay. Now I've broken it. Thanks very much. Um, Great event and uh, look, I'll keep this quick. Um, 
Fair Trading uh, administers the home building legislation, yeah, residential... Yeah, residential home building legislation. Fair Trading administers that. I'm Norm Foster. I'm the manager of the building inspectors in New South Wales. Wendy Hurd's from Fair Trading. There's a couple important things for the builders, contractors and the owners, uh, all those affected with rebuilding or partial rebuilding to keep in mind. Um, the home building legislation is there to protect the industry and also provide some consumer protection for, for you, the homeowners. To do that, you need to make sure that you're using licensed contractors. Um, there's been a number of instances where natural disasters like this and you'll get uh, blow-ins from interstate and uh, you've, I'm sure you've read about travelling conmen and all that sort of types of people. Make sure you're using a licensed tradesman. Um, if you're aware of any unlicensed activity, contact Fair Trading. I'm sure the council will be able to pass that information on as well. Um, but the consumer protection in the legislation is we provide uh, home warranty insurance provisions and also uh, dispute resolution. Should you get into a dispute, either you're a builder with your client or your client with your, um, with your builder or your contractor. There's a couple of steps to remember, and that is in particular, um, make sure you get the approvals. Don't start work until you get the approvals. That's very important. For builders, make sure you're getting your critical stage inspection certificates uh, done. That's your responsibility. If you're going to do your work as an owner builder and engage subcontractors, make sure you apply to Fair Trade to get an owner builder's permit. Council will need to know that as well. Um, get your approvals. Make sure that uh, you check the trade or the builder's licence and experience to do that work. Make sure there's insurances provided. Um, home warranty insurance for work over $20,000 labour and materials. I'm sure that's going to apply for all of these instances. Um, workers' comp, public indemnity, uh, public liability insurance. Make sure you get all that information off your trader. Make sure you're, you're the trader, you're providing that information. Contracts, complying contracts. To do residential building work, to aid and manage your client's expectation builders, make sure you use a complying contract which makes up part of that complying contract is the guide, uh, consumer building guide. Um, that's a very valuable document for homeowners. Get a hold of that. It'll under, let you understand what your rights and your responsibilities are and also the, uh, your builders. Again, when throughout the build, make sure you get those critical stage inspection certificates, whether it's from a PCA, a private certifying authority, or the council, make sure you book your inspection so that you get a compliant building at the end of the day. All too often there'll be variations throughout the job and it's important that your certifier picks those up and uh, does the right thing throughout the, throughout the build. One, uh, 1332.20 is a fair trading number. Um, you can ring, ask any questions on licensing or contracts, um, or you can go to our website. We've got a number of publications up the back. We'll stay around if anyone's got any particular questions, um, and we'll answer those. Thanks very much, and good luck. Thanks, Norm. OK, so people are just starting to drift off because it's getting very close to 9 o'clock. So just a couple more questions. And as I said earlier, all the presenters are going to be stay here and the council officers as well. So there will be times to get to, um, to ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. So we'll start with you, sir. Just for the benefit of owner-builders who've engaged in an owner-builders permit um, within the last five years, will Fair Trading waive that anniversary? So a question to Fair Trading about the owner builder's licence and whether you've, if you've had one in the last five years, will you waive that anniversary? I think that uh, that's going to be something that's going to have to be taken on notice. I doubt it. Um, I doubt it. But uh, you can certainly ask the question of us uh, you're, later. You're getting the look from Phil. You want to bet? <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Well, I'm, sure Phil, I'm sure Phil works at a higher level than I do. <laughs> Okay, ex excellent. Okay, so we've got a few hands up. Have we got microphone lady? Yes. Here and then the one straight over. Um, my question to Phil, can you tell me why there hasn't been a coronial inquest into 
both the Hawkesbury Road fire and the Yellow Rock fire? Uh, the question from the Macquarie Room is why there's not been a coronial inquiry in respect to the Hawkesbury Road fire of some weeks ago and the most recent fires. Uh, I can't speak in terms of the Hawkesbury Road fire, but I can assure you there will be a coronial inquiry in respect of the most recent fire. This doesn't happen overnight. It, it takes some time. Uh, the RFS has the capacity, as does the government, to ask the coroner to conduct an inquiry, or the coroner may, of his or her own volition, uh, indeed decide to do that. Normally, uh, these things are done in the, in, in the event of fatalities or serious injury, but given the gravity and magnitude of this event, I would be very surprised if there were not to be a coronial inquiry. Oh, it's, it's not automatic, no. It, it, if, it's not automatic if the, if the circumstances don't warrant a coronial inquiry, uh, then the coroner is not obliged uh, to have it, but it's, it's largely at his, own his or her own discretion or a request from the RFS. But, as I said, it would be implausible uh, to think that there would not be a coronial inquiry in this case. Okay. But I can't commit the coroner. One of the single biggest issues out of this is coming out to be the cost of meeting new building recommendations. So I guess my question is around the millions and millions of dollars that's been collected by charities of which ZIP's been issued. And, you know, it's now a month. We've all bought new bras and undies. We don't, we don't need to spend money on that. What we need is something sensible like $15 million divided by two... relatives, friends and everybody else have donated on the assumption that the money is going to be used for the best ability, not in six months' time or 12 months' time and not by some arbitrary decision made by a committee. It should really be very clear that if you're about 40, you get 20 grand. If you're flame zone, you get 50. If your house is damaged, 10%, you get X amount. It should be really easy and be able to fill in on the DA level. Thanks for leaving the hard ones for me, that's good. Um, look, I, I empathise with you completely. However, uh, at the risk of sounding bureaucratic, it's not that simple. Uh, the Mayor has established a mayoral relief fund. Uh, the Council met, I think, on Tuesday, uh, where a resolution uh, put to the Council to establish the trust to administer that fund which currently stands, and I'll explain this to you in a moment, and there aren't millions and millions, by the way, uh, the Salvation Army have raised probably somewhere in the order of 700 to 800,000, could be more. Uh, that, that may well be the case, but where is Woolworth putting that money? The, it's gone into the Salvation Army, and this is an area over which we have no jurisdiction. None whatsoever. Let, let me finish, please. The Mayor has established the fund. Well, we don't. We can't tell the Salvation Army what to do. They, they have chosen not to join the Mayor's appeal system. The Red Cross have chosen to join the Mayor's appeal system. Anglicare have chosen to join the Mayor's system. The Commonwealth Bank have chosen to join the Mayor's system. That money collectively stands at around about 1.5 million or somewhere in that order. I think it is Monday the Trust, which I chair, uh, will meet and determine the criteria. It will be done quickly, it will be done effectively, and it will be done equitably. Well. Well, I'm not going to accuse the Salvation Army of raising money fraudulently, as you might imagine. Um, suffice it to say that the Salvation Army, as well-intentioned as it is, has chosen, has taken a unilateral action not to join the more organised fundraising and distribution efforts. And it's something I, on which I can do nothing about.
The, the money over which the government and the council and the trust has control, which is those organisations that I've mentioned, will be distributed as quickly as possible in an equitable manner. But what you're asking now is for us to exercise influence over an organisation over which we have none. Can I, can I make a completely inappropriate suggestion, which I'm sure won't go further than these four walls? Um, social media is amazingly effective at getting these kind of decisions changed. And if just half of you were to hit Twitter and Facebook tomorrow with this issue, I think you would probably find that that might have an effect. Now, you didn't hear that from me, because I'm totally independent facilitator. OK, the man in the blue shirt. Um, my question is just related to backburning. In the last 10 years or 12 years since the last fire, we didn't see much. In future, is it going to be easier to get backburning done? I believe homes are a bit more important than some trees, you know. Okay, back burning. David? Um, David Jones yeah, from RFS is going to come up and take that. Um, in the last 17 or 18 months, we've done almost 15,700 hectares of hazard reduction, which is a significant increase on what's been done in previous periods. We do acknowledge that. Um, spread throughout the complete Blue Mountains areas. Uh, we, the Blue Mountains district covers 160,000 hectares um, and there is environmental considerations with all of that. We acknowledge all that. Uh, we are continuing on. We have a significant number of burn plans that are put in place already, sitting on the shelf as the term that we're using. Now is not the appropriate time during this bushfire period to uh, start lighting burns up. Um, however, we have a number of burns. We will continue to prepare burns, and that is a focus of some of my staff. Um, if you're looking for exactly how much every year, we would hope to do 10% of the total area every year, but there's the common sense approach needs to be some years we'll do more, some years we'll do less. It depends on the weather. It depends on a whole heap of factors. Excellent. So is that man there? Now, I live in a street that had approximately 43 houses burnt down. I've lived in the area for 40 years, yes. come in January. The last known fire that went through that area was 1968, that I know of, and we have one, had one backburn in 40 years. Or if you take the prior to that, when I moved here in 74, go back the, to the 68 fires, that's close to 46 years and one backburn. Now, I saw the fires, I think they were in the mid-70s that came through and there was a great effort by the RFS uh, and they stopped the fires on Hawkesbury Road at St Columbus College. And I've always said since that day, the day the fire crosses Hawkesbury Road, we're in big, big heap of <laughs> poo. And it happened. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to take that as a statement. I know that there is a lot of frustration about the back burning issue, but I'm, and and we're not going to be able to resolve it tonight. I'm conscious of the time. We've got a couple more questions, but I've got two. I've got a question. I think from the same person in the Macquarie room. One is when the block is clear, does that include the slab or removal of the slab which is cracked? And the other one is when our land is cleared, will the damaged concrete slab also be cleared? Can anybody answer that? Can anybody answer that? Or do we not know yet? Yes. Yes. Am I hearing yes or yes? It should be or yes, it will be. Okay. I think I think what I'm hearing is that with the demolition, it's only been announced today that we actually don't have the details as yet. Um, <coughs> but I feel you. <laughs> I'm just going to hand over to Phil. I'm assuming that man gave you pertinent advice. No. <laughs> uh, he just mentioned that asbestos contaminated sites will be um, completely, de after it's been removed, will be completely decontam decontaminated, yeah. Okay. And given clearance, apparently. Yeah. Right. Um, whilst I've got the mic, I'm just going to make a couple of reminders. One is that, as you've heard, as you've heard, starting Monday at 10 a.m., we've established a panel of experts from the RFS and the Blue Mountain City Council that will provide advice on your plans to rebuild. 
It'll cover things like the Australian Building Standard, Flame Zones, Bell 40s, Bell 29s and everything in between. So please avail yourself of that service starting Monday 10am in the offices of the Recovery Office, not the Recovery Centre, the Recovery Office uh, at uh, Springwood below the library. Secondly, could you please note your calendars for the 24th, 10am uh, to 12 midday, a community forum for those who have lost your houses uh, and other possessions on the issue of donated goods and services. Very important that you're there. there. Would you also please note your calendars for the 1st of December for a community event, uh, the, the former at Wimbledon High School, this one also, 1st of December uh, at the uh, Wimbledon High School. Two very important events and uh, I would urge you to try and attend them. Lastly, um, the provisions announced today by the government for building uh, rubble removal will be on our website uh, when, um, Lin uh, Lindell, when will the information about rubble removal be on our website? Uh, before the DA project starts on Monday. Okay. Some initial information. Yeah. Some initial information will be on there tomorrow, but before the DA applications uh, 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 business starts. Uh, it, it's um, www or three w's, all the w's, whatever, <laughs> however many w's you prefer. Uh, Blue Mountains Bushfire Recovery dot com, um, but you can get there via other links, not the least being the Blue Mountain City Council. Uh, so details, more details than I've given you on that issue will be on the website uh, in the next few days. Great. Look, and. And I'm just noticing that people are leaving in. So I just want to also remind you that um, local architects are um, donating their time to give each of you property owners who've lost your homes a free one hour rebuilding advisory service from Monday at the Springwood Rebuilding Service Centre at the library. Okay, just a couple more questions. Yes, Mr. Man in the blue shirt, you've been waiting patiently. Yep. Um I've got a current renovation DA approved that's been going for eight months before the fire took it. That rating of the bow is a lot lower than I look on the board and it's flame zone now. Right. Has there been a different approach taken to reviewing these um, bow levels this time? Okay, so the question was that a man's got an existing DA for Renault's and that the new, the bow rating that he now sees on the back of the room here is different. Has there been a different approach? As I said, that was only an indicative bow plan. Um, it was... This one here? Yep. It was very roughly done and more specific and detailed site assessments will be conducted as part of the, the Springwood Centre. So, so it, need it, to come and talk to you, it sounds like to me? If it's the, the consent, that the, the most recent consent, as Chris spoke about, if it's that stream, then the, the standard conditions should still stand. Um, my question is also for the Rural Fire Service. Um, I just wondered what kind of measures might have been put in place um, to make electricity companies, for example, more accountable on days that are obviously so dangerous for fires, like we had on that Thursday, where the weather conditions were such that um, uh, electrical wires broke and they ignited flames, which is my understanding was the starting of the fires in Springwood and Mount Victoria, and whether or not there have been any restrictions placed on electricity companies when there are days like that that they actually turn the electricity off so that fires don't start in the first place. Okay, so the question is about restrictions on electricity companies to turn the electricity off on high fire dangers where it's clear that if the wires break they'll start a fire. Can I ask somebody to close that door at the back because we can't actually here, sorry, and um, Phil is, no, David, Phil, yeah, Phil. Uh, this has been a debate raging around the nation uh, since the Ash Wednesday fires of 1983, of course. South Australia is the only Australian jurisdiction so far to have procedures in place for uh, shutting down parts of the grid uh, on certain fire danger rating days. There is a counter-argument, and, and New South Wales has not to, yet developed a position on this. There is a counter-argument, of course, uh, and that is that many of the warning systems uh, rely on electricity. There are people very heavily reliant 
uh, on various types of life support systems which rely on electricity, um, traffic lights, uh, a range of information devices, uh, mobile telephones, if, they're not, if they run out of battery, how do you charge them if it's for, for a prolonged period? Some health experts are saying uh, that it may be more dangerous to cut the power off in terms of threat to human life and well-being than it is um, to, to leave it on and deal with the associated bushfire risk. It, it is a debate which is being held uh, in every state uh, and uh, New South Wales is still to make a determination on it. But as I said, there are two very strong arguments and they are opposing arguments. Okay, so look, it's nine o'clock, so what I think I'm going to do is ask Councillor Lucchetti, the Deputy Mayor, to come and just do a formal close. And just a reminder that everyone is going to be here, so if you do have specific questions, come and ask them. The Rural Fire Service has a range of brochures up the back, plus that indicative bowel map, which is in its early stages, so it's not cast in concrete, but it might give you an idea. So just over to you, Councillor Lucchetti. Thanks, Lucy. Look, just before I wrap up, on, on the issue, too, of uh, electricity, on Tuesday night at the council meeting just gone, council again unanimously and strongly uh, re-endorsed council's standing position of undergrounding power lines in this LGA. Um, we will continue to make strong representation uh, on that issue because uh, it just makes no sense at all not to do it. Um, Look, in, in wrapping up, I hope you all got something out of that. I, I hope some of the information was useful. Look, I, I take on board that a lot of the information wasn't good news uh, and a lot of it was, was not you know, what, what you would be well, you know, call well received. Um, look, the, the, these are the times we now live in. All right? they're, they're difficult times. Um, as an elected body, um, some of the stuff that's come up tonight uh, you know, you could call it, you know, council issues sort of stuff. If you are frustrated with the way that's going for you, all right, if you think that there is a, a better solution or a better response to what you are, do, are getting, if you refer that to any of the elected councillors, look, if we can make policy decision to change what is frustrating you, we will do so. All right, everything's on the table. If we have the, the powers to sort of, you know, to make your life easier by the decisions we make in the council chamber, we will definitely do that. Um, again, thank you for coming. Thanks to everyone from the RFS, from council, Phil, councillors, uh, and Lucy. Um, again, if you have case by case, site-specific questions, um, come forward to ask them. Alternatively, if you go to the centre that will open at council offices next week, they will deal with all of your case-by-case -case issues and questions uh, at length, in depth, for as much time as you need. Um, as I said earlier, if you want to speak to uh, any of the councillors who are here, and I note that the Mayor is now with us, uh, we are going to go through to the, to the bar um, and you know, please join us.